911. What is the address of your emergency? <laughs> My son is dead. What was that? My son is dead. Okay, we're going to have lots of help coming to you, okay? Anytime you have a death, uh, detectives are at minimum notified. In this instance, it's it's not just a suicide. We respond to all suicides. This was um, sadly the the life of a, of a young man that was lost. I'm coming up on 17 years in law enforcement, and this case was easily the one that just sticks in my head that I can't get out of my head. Anytime you respond to a suicide, let me just hit it. It's awful. It's it's. It's never good, but when you have a teenager, especially one that's so young, in my mind, all I'm thinking is, this is, this is someone who, who hasn't yet got to enjoy the best times of their lives. What hit home for me on what I was actually going to physically be walking into was the deafening silence and the looks on the officers and sergeant's faces before I even walked in the house. Did you guys go in? No, we haven't gone in. Okay, don't. Yeah. <laughs> I worked patrol as a, a shift sergeant for about three and a half years. And in part of that time, uh, I did respond to uh, the Mateo house. We try to prepare ourselves physically, mentally. We attend our annual certifications. Uh, most of us go above and beyond on our own with other trainings whether or reading a book to help us uh, be better at what we do because we're always looking for that next way to, to be better. It was almost that look as if this was not, this was not what I expected. This was not something I had prepared for or knew I should have to prepare myself for. It was just, it was one of those scenes. That's how the looks on their faces uh, appeared to me. Going in there and, and, and seeing what we saw was definitely a, a horrific scene. Yeah, it's shocking. I think the first person that I saw was, was Sergeant Josh Fisher. And Josh is a pretty, pretty happy-go-lucky guy, always kind of positive, always um, yeah, super friendly. Um, and it's not that he wasn't friendly on this day, but his demeanor was different. They never made me feel like confined in here or like, you know, even though I knew I was a suspect, they never made me feel like I was in trouble or anything. They just hung out with me and talked to me. And what ended up happening is I said, wait a minute, I have footage to show like when I get home. And they see me come in and they see me, you know, Brandon get home, they see me drive up, they see everything. And then, and then the video plays where I start screaming for two and a half minutes, the kind of screaming that no movie will ever get right. It's primal, it's terrifying. And, um, and their face changes. And one of them actually, I'm, I'm trying to turn it off, and one of them actually reaches over and turns off my phone and says, like, I, I can't hear any more of your, like, my scream. People hear it in their nightmares, you know? And he, he said, uh, you're not a suspect to us anymore. I never watched the video. Um, and I'll be honest, it was a conscious decision for me not to watch it. It was awful enough having to go in and do an investigation in itself and see the things I saw, but then to compound it with a mother finding her son, I don't know how I would be able to deal with that. Utter um, loss. I mean, utter loss. I, I don't have the, the words to describe a mother's, the sound of a mother's loss. Um, I have a son as well who is a little older than uh, Brandon was at the time, but uh, you definitely uh, empathize with the family and the situation they're in and, and uh, what you see. So they actually uh, called a cleaning company that night. Um, it was 11, 30, 12 o'clock before the cleaners even got here, but they were not going to leave me to find that in the morning. I, I could not with good conscience leave the family to, to clean up afterwards. I, I couldn't imagine uh, something like that happening to, to my family. They also stayed here until 2 a.m. 
the, the female officer and Josh, um, so that we could try to sleep. You just try and humanize the situation and help people. The response is one part, then there's usually investigations that can sometimes follow, and then after all of that's over, we're still there. So we need to make sure that we reach out to our people and understand that they're able to process these things, that they're not struggling with processing them. If they are, get them the help that they need. These situations you try to put out of your head, you try not to remember. So there are, are some details that I have done that with, I've tried to put behind me, just so you can, you know, work through the next, the next call. You don't, you can't, you can't hang on to them. You try not to, or else it'll, it just does you no good on your next call. What I went through, as Brandon's mom to get counseling, to get therapy, to get, I mean, that sucked. And I only saw it once. I don't know what you guys see every day, but it should not be hard. And it should be like openly talked about. And that's where we have a, a roadblock is. How many officers, male or female or whatever, are willing to look at another officer and say, I am not okay. It's been a year and I'm not okay by what I saw. It's always there in some way, shape, or form. Um, maybe not always at the forefront, but it's there, and it's never gonna leave. And it's by far the, the most awful scene, the most awful thing I've had to investigate. Definitely, uh, that is one of the reasons why I went into search and rescue. You just get to the point where you just didn't wanna go to those calls anymore. You didn't wanna do it anymore. That's, that's the only way I can explain it. Again, you try to, try to put it past you and you try and forget, but um, yeah, you just get to the point, at least for me, it just, I don't wanna do these calls anymore. I don't wanna to go to them anymore.